家下午好，欢迎大家来参加设计面大师说。今天我们的直播是北京与香港的连线，非常荣幸的邀请到 Adidas 的创始人 Kiss 基达夫，欢迎你。Thank you, thanks for having me here. 嗯，大师说曾邀请到了阿曼的创始人 Andrew Azaka 先生，包括呃雅布布舍伯格，包括 Thomas Heiswick 等等。那 Adidas 作为全球知名的设计公司之一呢？呃，我今天也非常的呃荣幸，就是能够透过他三十八年来，从第一个人到一千四百个人的团队里面，我们的这场对话不仅仅是探讨设计的创新与突破，更重要的是想听听他的管理。今天的对话特别邀请到了上百家的开发商，比如说瑞安、和盛创展、华润、万科、融创、绿城等等。同时，我们要特别感谢我们的支持方。呃，与一家与全球世界顶级的艺术家设计师合作的法国水晶品牌的 l i k 好，那我们对话就现在开始。您的作品呢，涉及的就是世界各地、全球。呃，你的文化性、地理标性其实是你文相关的高频词汇。那您的哲设计的哲学是什么？呃，如何理解您的设计中的文化性与地标性 ？Thank you. Um, well, first of all, when we design, we Need to respect the client's requirements and meet the client's requirements first and foremost. We also need to meet the user's requirements and make sure that the building is is fit for purpose for the user. But more importantly than all of that is that the building is going to be in that city or in that town for years to come, long after the client, long after the users have changed. So we have to concern ourselves with the culture of the city. And be sure that the building is designed in an appropriate way, looking to the future of the city and ensuring it can meet all the demands of that city in the future. That I want to know is how the cultural aspect of your design is represented in the design. Okay. Yes. I don't think there's any、uh, simple answer for how to represent culture.、Uh, culture is, is inside us. It's the way we've been brought up. It's the history. It's the The geography, it's the climate, the language, it's everything about a people's. And in order to understand it, we have to embed ourselves in it and really, truly live that culture. Now, of course, it's impossible for for me as as a designer to understand all cultures to the depth that I can design for all cultures. So, what we do in Idas is we establish offices. In all the regions where we're going to design buildings, and employ local people and teach in the local universities, and by doing that, each of our offices is like a local office, as well as being an international office. So, as well as bringing all the international knowledge to bear upon the building, it also designs. With an understanding of local culture, so you can't make a, a, a resume for that. But what you can do, it, in the way that the local people who are working with us understand the local culture, it will be embedded in the design automatically, and therefore our buildings tend to be very iconic because they're always unique. To that place, that time, that culture, as well as being truly international. 对，刚才提到了这个，你的项目里面有很多文化性的标志性。呃，那我也想接下来想问问，就是亚洲或者是中国其他的地方，就是，呃，相比于其他地方来讲，就是它的独特之处在于什么 ？I'm fond of an analogy there. If we look at Europe and all the many countries in Europe. Europe is actually smaller geographically than China, so China has as many cultures as Europe. It's one country, but many, many cultures. And then, if we if we look further around Asia, to Southeast Asia, to the many countries of Southeast Asia, of、um, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. Then again, we have many, many cultures. They're all extremely different. In fact, in many ways, more different than European cultures. If we compare Philippine, Malaysian, Cambodian culture 
to Beijing or Shanghai cultures, that's a huge gulf, more than the gulf between Norway, Sweden, and, and Italy, let's say. So that, I think that's a good parallel to explain the huge variety of culture in Asia and in China. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, I've been traveling to China for many, many years uh, and seen Beijing develop uh, in the last 20 years. And uh, we first established our office there in 2002, so a very long time ago. And uh, our first uh, building there was Fortune Plaza, which is now considered to be quite an old, old building. Um, I think what grabs me about about Beijing more than anything else is the planning of the city. It's extraordinarily well planned in this uh, grid pattern city moving out from a center, establishing the ring roads. And then that grid, that methodology of grid is taken all the way through to the planning of the courtyard buildings and this orthogonal grid creating spaces between buildings. So the entire city has this methodology of urban design and of building design, which is cohesive. It is the most cohesive city that I've ever been to. It's almost as if no stone is out of place. No space is out of place. It almost seems predestined by a master grid or a master mason, that everything occurs in a logical and very beautiful sequence. Uh, I think the, the future of architecture in the West is about insertion. We already have our framework of cities and we're inserting into that framework. And in the West, most cities are very old. Uh, they have a continual regeneration of buildings that goes back five or 600 years. So we have to be very careful about how we make an insertion into, into the city because we don't want to disturb that incredibly fragile web of urban design and, and buildings. Now, of course, for Asia, it's different. China is urbanizing rapidly and building new cities and extending its existing cities at a very rapid rate. And it's not about insertion. It's about planning, urban planning and large-scale planning for new cities and extensions to cities. Now, in doing that, China has leapfrogged over the centuries of development of Western cities as they developed slowly and they finally came to the age of, of trans mechanized transportation, the motor car and buses and so on, and to find that their cities were actually not appropriate for mechanized transportation because the roads were too narrow, they were too close together, the plot sizes were too small, and therefore, Western city has a huge amount of difficulty uh, becoming more dense, ensuring the infrastructure can work properly. Whilst with China cities, we're basically moving into urbanization directly so we can plan wisely for a high density city. Now, an analogy I like to make if we say that London average density is around three and a half thousand to five thousand people per square kilometer. Most Asian cities exceed 30,000 people per square kilometer. That's 10 times the density. What does that mean? 
Well, it means a lot of good things. It means that we're building cities in Asia in a very compact way. We're saving land. We're building smart cities. We're using less private transportation and more public transportation. We're using less carbon in our cities. Because they're high density, high rise cities, they can connect well. They can use the internet of things. They can use big data to run the city in a very efficient way. Now, all of these things are the future of Asia. It won't be the future of the West because the West has already built. But the future of Asia is high density, high rise cities, well organized, using space well, highly sustainable. And importantly, this is a new, a new uh, development for Chinese cities, is as the density goes up, so we need more public space at the lower levels of these buildings. The sidewalks are not enough. You can't get all of the people onto the sidewalk when you're dealing with, with such high density cities. So what we're finding is that we've got uh, subterranean walkways at B2 and B1, ground floor and then we have bridges at level two and level three and, and even up to level five level six china cities are developing public space at many many levels and those public spaces are not just walkways they're parks in the sky many ways of connecting up the cities uh, even multi uh, multi-story open air retail street retail we call it so all of these devices are brand new they are not practiced anywhere else in the world. They're being developed uniquely and solely for China, and they are the future of our cities if they're going to be sustainable. Now, um, you also asked uh, in terms of future, I wanted to, to draw a line between short-term future and long-term future. We're all dealing with a short-term future of the COVID-19 virus. And that short-term future is accelerating change. It's not creating anything new, but what it is doing is it's accelerating things that were already happening. And what was already happening was that purchasing online, for example, was changing the nature of offline street retail and malls and malls were actually having to reinvent themselves in order to deal with online it's not to say they're going to go away but they're going to be different shopping will be a different experience we'll be able to be at home looking at our at our devices and buying things at the leisure of our homes and taking delivery but we will still need to experience those things we'll need to talk to our friends and we will need to go out to do that and it's not just retail if we think about what's happened during covid with work the whole world experienced what it is to work from home and the whole world actually rather liked it people got to understand that you can work from home very efficiently indeed and you don't need to be in an office 100 percent of the time in fact some large organizations like twitter don't even want their staff back they've told them to stay at home and other organizations are finding it exceedingly difficult to get their staff back and only 30 percent of them want to come back what does that mean for the future of the city and for the future of architecture? We were already talking about a better live work dynamic. Well, now we've experienced it. It's very nice working from home. Many meetings like this meeting can be held online. We only need to go into the office where we need to be physically present with somebody, which is not much of the time. Or we need to go into the office where we have a high degree of coordination to do with other people. It doesn't happen all the time. 
our office has became, over the last 20 years, a very uncomfortable, high-density compacting of people with hot desking, crowded rooms, sky-high rents. I don't think that's going to survive. I think what we're going to get is that in the future, our offices will be less dense. People will be working further apart from each other. Hot desks will be a thing of the past. And I think shared workspace, like we work, are going to be find their business model lower rents, more space, more flexible hours, leading to less crowding on subway trains and buses. This is the way of the future. Short-term future, an accelerant towards a much bigger and more humane future for all of us.就像今天我们可以远程的这种面对面的这种交流，其实大家已经慢慢习惯了这种方式，包括刚才他提到了这种变化，其实是呃无论是工作的灵活性、生活的这种便利性等等，其实它反映到了设计里面，其实是带给了
in those days, in, in the 80s, the early 80s, uh, Hong Kong was coming out of a recession, a very deep recession in 82, and was starting to, to uh, come up quite strongly. The city was building, its, uh, building out its first mass transit railway line, and uh, we're starting to develop more office buildings and building a lot of residential as, uh, as it went into a public housing program to house everybody in the city. The city had grown enormously. It had uh, a lot of squatters, a lot of people that weren't housed properly. The 80s were a period of rapid growth in Hong Kong, and there was a huge amount of work uh, here to build this city. I mean, Hong Kong was virtually built in in the 80s, expanded enormously in the 80s. So it was a very good time uh, to set up a, a very small practice, only two people, and uh, to grow that practice uh, slowly through the course of the 80s. Okay, so the 80s was done, and Hong Kong had, uh, had uh, developed a number of very large developers who were looking overseas for what they could do next. And the Mass Transit <clears throat> Railway Corporation had a lot of people out here in Hong Kong who were very well versed in building railways. And it so happened, of course, that about that point in time, we had the Asian Tigers in the 90s. And the Asian Tigers were, uh, were Korea and uh, Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, and, and Hong Kong. And uh, those Asian tiger economies were roaring away through the 90s. And Singapore was building out its new uh, subway system. So uh, we actually could move down there and uh, start design on their mass transit railway system as well, because we've been designing Hong Kong's mass transit railway system. So we started to move with the trains as the trains moved from Hong Kong to Singapore, from Singapore to the Middle East. And finally to London, so we, <clears throat> we moved and started designing train systems in London. At that time, a lot of the developers in Hong Kong became active in Southeast Asia. We established an office in, in Singapore, and we were also an office in Kuala Lumpur, and we were working throughout Southeast Asia in all the countries of Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, until 1997, when, of course, the Asian financial crisis caused a massive collapse of uh, all the economies of, of Southeast Asia. And some of those economies didn't recover for many, many years indeed. Uh, around uh, the time of the Asian financial crisis, however, China started to develop. At the same time, uh, a lot of developers were looking at uh, London, so we established offices in London. We had a lot of interest in projects in the Middle East in the early part of the 20th century, 21st century. So we opened an office in Dubai in about 2004 and did a lot of the, the mega high rise buildings in Dubai. I would say since 2010, moving on to the, the latest period of uh, 10 years, the latest decade then really the story has been about, about China. Um, Hong Kong's been very quiet. Uh, Singapore's been relatively quiet. It has built out the city now. Southeast Asia is relatively developed. London has been extraordinarily quiet, as has Europe. Our Seattle office has been busy at the time of COVID because it's a, it focuses upon uh, medical research. So we have been very busy indeed in, in Seattle. But really, the story is about China for us. And now we have offices established in Chengdu, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Macau, and Hong Kong. Okay. All right, we have a, a, a unique structure to IDAS. Um, what we have is local owners and international owners. So we have a holding company, uh, IDAS International, which has 10 
directors, 10 design directors, we're all designers. And then that holding company owns uh, proportions of the operational companies, which are China, Hong Kong, Singapore, London, America. And the uh, group company, the top company, International, owns roughly around half of the operational companies. The other half is owned by local owners. So that's really important because what it means is the local owners are incentivized to do really well for their cities and for their clients. How do we hold that all together? I mean, it sounds like it could be quite difficult to hold together 12 offices and 1,200 people. Well, in fact, we do it through design. We don't do it through management or rules or frequent meetings. Mm. We have a simple rule. Every building we design has two design directors. One from the local office that is realizing and building out that design, and the other one from another office, one of the 12 offices. In that way, we get two teams of designers working together on every project we do, which means that we're constantly swapping international information and local information through the network of IDA's offices. And that network of offices is essentially an online network. It's, we started the online network of, of IDAS about 10 or 15 years ago. And the amount of communication that we carry out online now is intense. Every sketch is transmitted through to the associate office, the budding being designed buddies upon the project, sharing information back and forth across the offices. So you could see IDAS as a sort of neural network of information, global information just being shared around that network and incentivized to share by the structure of the company. No matter if you're a junior architect in, in IDAS, you can see a clear career path to eventually become an owner if you want to become an owner, of which we have nearly 40 owners in the company, or whichever direction you wish to go in. The proof that it works is, in the last 25 years, we have only had one design director leave us. I think that's a unique uh, uh, figure, unique statement, and it really does show that we're doing something right for our structure and our staff. Okay, so that's sort of going on from that thesis that I was just uh, uh, expounding upon. So, Architecture is, once you leave university, architecture is taught by practicing architecture. We learn all the time. Um, I'm still learning, but we can never stop. It's like a doctor. You cannot stop learning about medicine because there are constant advances. And the same with architecture. You need to keep learning, keep learning. So when we come out of university as a young architect, we have so much to learn. And what's very important is that we get put into a team of mixed experienced people, from similar young people to people with three or four years experience, to people with 10 years experience, people with 20 years experience. And that we get exposed to all of the uh, design issues that we need to solve so that we can see how it works and we can develop our own personal design skills. We make very certain that our staff in IDAS get a very, very rounded experience as they develop up through IDAS. We also more formally host uh, global design workshops. 
and uh, three or four times a year, we'll gather together about 20 people and we'll send them off to, to some wonderful place um, on a beach or up a mountain. And uh, they will do three days of very intensive design sessions upon real design problems, upon real projects. And the people that we send on those design workshops are a cross-section right through the company from people with one year experience to directors. So you end up in a team of five people, a director, a design director, all the way through to a very young architect. You uh, take everything with you. So where we're going uh, is usually a hotel in the middle of nowhere. We have no access to uh, fantastic uh, online data or computers. We have to do everything by hand. Um, the director cannot rely upon armies of people. He has to start drawing himself and using his own computer. So this process brings everybody to a humble level. The, the young architect leaving university or the design director 60 years old, it makes no difference. You're both tackling the same design issue and drawing it in a way that you can explain it to your fellow designers at the end of the day so that they can critique it and move on to the next design the next day. So it's an exercise in design, quick design, fast design, humble working together as a team to create a great output in a very short space of time. Humble humility, that's a great word for architects, and I think it's a very important word. We must remember that we are designing for the world. We are the servants. We're creating buildings that other people have to live with. That is a huge responsibility, and we must meet it with humility. 我很想了解艾达斯的晋升体系。假设我是想进入艾达斯的一个年轻的建筑师，呃，我会经过几年的时间，或者是说给我一点希望，我怎么能成为从一个普通的建筑师到设计董事这样的一个角色？Jessica, you're very ambitious. When do you want to join? Okay.我先知道我能不能成为设计董事。<laughs> okay, so uh, let's take a typical career path. <clears throat> if I, I'll, take, I'll take specifics because it's easier. Um, in 1998, um, we employed uh, some young students, five, five young students from the university. <clears throat> the uh, market was very poor. Um, those students uh, developed such that by the age of um, 33 they were directors so in about nine or ten years they had developed to become directors there are steps along the way um, from a graduate architect year one to year two to year three but that's a relatively fast career path nine years to directors, um, so about the age of 33. Uh, before the age of 40, by the age of 38, 36 to 38, they were also shareholders. Um, and now uh, they are on the main board, they're in their early 40s, and they are on the main board, uh, group board, of uh, Idis International. So, Nine years to become a director, and uh, about um, 18 years to become a shareholder, which is relatively fast. So, this is that's fascinating. Um, and, and yes, very interesting. Um, when I first left university, I went to work for a company called Arab Associates. Arab Associates is the architectural arm of Arab, the engineers. 
And Ove Arup was a socialist. Um, and he set up the company in such a way that everybody in Arabs is a shareholder. Everybody from the coffee lady and the cleaner all the way through to the directors was a shareholder of Arabs. It was a fascinating experience because Arabs created these wonderful socially conscious buildings. Um, it only had a little problem. For a young motivated and ambitious young architect like myself, it was a very long career path. The tea lady had more shares than I had, and that was a little upsetting. So I left and I joined the other extreme, Foster. Foster is a company that is owned by one man. And it's extremely pyramidal. It focuses on excellence in design above all else. And that was also a wonderful experience. But when it came time for me to set up my own company in, uh, in 82, 85, uh, the, um, the key point here was that I wanted to set up a company that combined the power and drive and initiative of Fosters and the humanitarian principles of Arab. Would it be possible to combine these two very powerful forces of humanity? Every human being has a drive to succeed and an initiative. But equally, we need to temper that with humility, care for others, and creating a fair and safe environment. I wanted to create a company that could achieve those aims. And I think we've done that. I think the rather interesting structure that we have incentivizes competition. We're highly comp competitive to move ahead and create better designs. But it's very collegiate. It has a sense of a university of all working together to do something better. And also what I've noticed in this time of COVID is that we sort of work, each office works as um, a social entity. We all look after each other. We all know what we're doing, what difficulties we're facing at this time of difficulty. And within the offices, we've been sharing huge amounts of solutions of how to work with the constraints of COVID and how to be safe as we move ahead. So yes, I think I think that's we achieved the aim. 呃，规划里面，您是从五年的一个计划，十年，还是说每天都有一些不一样的变化？啊， there's two things coming here. One is, yes, do we have uh, uh, plans? I think I think countries can have five-year plans. I think for an uh, architectural practice, we're a little bit too small to have five-year plans because we're very much dictated to by the markets and by what's happening is outside of our our hands and um, the 97 financial crisis we couldn't have seen that coming um, but that took us out of Southeast Asia for a while and took us into China um, that that was a, a, a result of change outside of our hands and we couldn't have foreseen it so what was important was that we could react quickly and I think this is the the uh, very important part of being an architect is that you can react to change and accept change. Change is good. There's nothing to be afraid of in change. Quite the reverse. We need to embrace change, understand it, and work with it. Because undoubtedly when there is change, what happens at the end will be better, ultimately.
It may not be better along the way. It may be very uncomfortable along the way, as with COVID right now. Um, but by the time you deal with all of those issues and you found a new direction, a new way ahead, the end will be better, definitely better. So what I would say about the way Ida's plans uh, is that we analyze, we look carefully for what's happening, how countries are moving, how urbanization is happening in China, what's happening in Southeast Asia, what's happening in London. We look for opportunity. We don't like to go head to head with other architectural companies. We look for where they're not going. So if they're all going over there, we'll go over there. We look for skill sets that others don't have, such as designing airports or designing railway stations or biomedical facilities. So we specialize and we provide a different type of service. So we're not running with the herd all the time. We can, we can go and do special things somewhere else. And all of that enables us to be a little bit like a race car, a bit like a Formula One race car, always being tuned up, getting ready to go faster and faster wherever it is we need to go. And after all, design is about that. Design is highly specialized. It's about doing very special, very learned, very exciting things, sometimes in a very short space of time. It's not about going on and on and on. It's about being fast and efficient and quick and learned. Mm. So we, yes, we don't have five-year plans, but we do have a big vision. We have a vision that what we would like to be in the future, some point, and we're a long way away from it now, what we'd like to be is a learned institution. So that network that we've got of all that information is very powerful. That 1,200 people, they've all got all this information and knowledge and experience and they're all sharing it, buzzing away. And how powerful is that? Who else could tap into that? Who else might find that useful? And how much could that network of ours reach out and learn more? How much can it expand using new online technologies and learning systems to take on even more data, even more learning? And when we've got to that point, won't governments be interested in asking us for our opinion? Won't universities be asking us to work with them on research programs? And we will cease to be simply commercial architects resolving problems for urbanization and cities, but we'll become more a resource center and a learning center and somewhere that people can go and develop other knowledge as well. So that's where I'd like IDAS to be in, in the future and hopefully in the near future. 世纪湾今年创立第六年了，我们也是成立了世纪湾的学院。呃，我自己一直会觉得，媒体它除了传播的价值之外，呃，更多的去把全球好的设计的资源在这个平台上展现，然后信息的一些输出能够帮助更多的人。我觉得这也是一份呃，作为媒体人的一份责任。Yes, I agree. Yes, yes. 我其实在这个采访过程里面，我特别喜欢问的，除了设计管理之外，我自己也很好奇对于这个人个人来讲的问题，所以我想问问 Case， 最近有没有经常在思考的问题，有没有找到答案 ？Yes, it's interesting, isn't it?、Um, I'm sure we've all, all over the world,、uh, had this time at home、um, where we haven't been working at 120%. And maybe we've been working at eighty percent, possibly for the first time in our lives.、Um, certainly, the first time in my life that I've actually、uh, taken a stop or a, a slowdown for five months, and、um, it's been fascinating and and quite enjoyable.、Uh, slowing down to consider is very important, and some people take a year off,、um, but the whole world has had to. Slow down, and think about things, and think about what do they want, and are they actually doing what they want, 
or can they do better? And can we change things? Um, at the start of COVID, there was a very beautiful poem written by a, a, an Irish lady, um, and I think it was called um, And the People Stayed Home. It was, it's very beautiful. So that poem expressed a heartfelt wish that people would uh, come out of COVID better, that the world would come out better. And it's a great opportunity for exactly that to happen. Unfortunately, it's also a great opportunity for divisiveness, finger pointing, difficulties, and creating trouble. I do hope that the latter doesn't win and that we come out with a wiser and better world. Um, we should. I think we'll come out with a better connected world uh, with a high degree of change, as I've mentioned to the online platforms and so on, with better quality of life, where workers insisting that they need quality of life, a live work quality. I think we'll come out also consuming less have you noticed how little money we've been spending? We've had nothing to spend it on. We've had no opportunities. But I think we've all, for five or six months, realized that some of the things we were buying were unnecessary and we could do without it. Mm. And possibly we've learned new ways to live our lives. <clears throat> Maybe we're using um, canned prepared entertainment less and we're talking with our friends more be it online so all of these things are things that i'm concerned about and thinking about at this point in time and trying to draw conclusions not just about architecture but also about what our lives will be like in the future because that affects our architecture so considerations like offices will require more space per person, will require indoor-outdoor space, where you can go out onto a terrace or balcony to have a look at the view, relax, take it easy. Offices will require more breakout space where you can talk to your friends. And they will, offices will need to be more closely connected to places that we live because we'll be doing live work we'll be doing working from home working from office so people will seek to live closer to their offices our homes our apartments we probably will get briefs as architects where we'll be asked to be to be thinking about where is the space that the apartment owner works from and maybe we'll find the old concept of study, the room that you work from, come back into our plans. Certainly, maybe the residential buildings will have spaces that people can have meetings, not just a pool, but somewhere that you might have a work meeting or an electronic work meeting within residential buildings. All of these things are going to be changed as a result of COVID. Um, I think, and this is, this is pushing into other areas, the way that we lead our lives in our cities, outside of our homes and offices, will not be so focused upon the instant gratification of buying something. You know that feel good factor when you spend some money and you make a purchase. And that's not just because of online, because you know what, if it arrives on your doorstep, it's just as good as if you went to the mall. But it also, at the end of COVID, when people can come out, they will be seeking to interact with their friends and with society, and they won't be so concerned about going to shops and buying things. 
that concern will have gone away. So your shopping mall and shopping street will go back to what they used to be before the 1960s. These were social hubs. They were where people met, where people swapped news, where people enjoyed the culture of their cities, not where they just went to buy something. China is lucky. It has a very short history of the shopping mall. The shopping mall started in the 1960s in America and spread across Europe. It has a 50 year unfortunate history. I do not think China will have a long love affair with shopping malls, luckily. I think street retail and spaces, air conditioned spaces for people to get together to swap information and news, to be entertained, to have a coffee, to feel and touch clothes and products, but not just to buy. A much more interactive, cultural experience concerned more with our society, as indeed all of our high streets and forums and agoras of our cities of times gone by were. So I think it's a massive change, and I think there's a lot of pain will come from this change as department stores close down, as international retailers go bankrupt. But at the end of that change, we will have better cities and better towns. 为什么要促使你做这样的事情? Okay. Um, I need a little bit of an explanation first before we get into it. So, so St. David's is a very small little village of 1,400 people. So it's extremely tiny. And it's positioned within a very beautiful coastal national park on the extreme west coast of Britain. So it's surrounded by sea, um, it's a tiny, tiny place, surrounded on all three sides by sea, very beautiful beaches, coastline, sticking out into the Atlantic Ocean with very, very few people who speak another language called Welsh. And um, <clears throat> being brought up there is fascinating because in microcosm, it is a city. It has all of the... Uh, Character, characterizations of a city, all of the connectivities of a city, but much simpler because it's only 1,400 people. So a few years back, back in 2009, uh, I found out that the city was failing, that the little place was failing. It was a tourist place, but it couldn't get uh, any more tourists because it wasn't allowed to build new buildings because it was a very beautiful national park. They're not allowed to build new buildings in the park. So I thought, well, to prove, because I, I lecture a lot about, about uh, adaptive reuse, about improvements to cities, urbanization, I thought, well, I'm, I wonder if I can apply this knowledge to a tiny little place and see if it works. And I thought, well, what I'll try to do is bring in high net worth, um, very wealthy tourists to this little place to enjoy the sea and the coast. And uh, because I can't build new, I would buy three ancient buildings and adaptively restore them as hotels. So the oldest one is 900 years old. It's a castle. And... So over three years, we bought these buildings, set up a foundation, restored them, and uh, we're, we're very fortunate now. We've brought a lot of very wealthy people into the little village. The number of uh, shops on the high street has doubled, so things are looking good. And uh, the school is, is open. It was in danger of shutting. And uh, people seem to say, you can do it. So yeah, now if you put your mind to it, you can, you can do anything. 
呃，那今天呢，我们的采访呃基本上到这里，但是呢，我们其实还有一个环节，就是呃，我们的呃读者受众他其实提了一些问题，我们要挑选两个问题来做一个呃解答。第一个问题是呃，如何建议和引导发展商在土地紧缺、地价上涨、居住和办公空间两地化布局的现有格局下，创造出更多适应居家办公的一些呃生活空间 ？Yeah, OK. It's a good question. Um, um, my, my belief is the solution uh, for this in, in China is high density, high rise, with a difference. So far, the model in China has been to develop a shopping center onto which we place the towers. The degree of integration of the towers with a shopping center is not great. It's usually you come down to ground and connect at the ground floor. What does that mean? It means you're basically separating all the functionality of a mixed commercial development. And the aim of a mixed commercial development is to allow each of the uses, the hotel, the service department, the office, and the retail to help each other, to push each other, so that one plus one plus one is not three, one plus one plus one is five. So to do that, to achieve that better integration, we need what I call porosity. We don't bring everybody to ground. The tower with the office floors or the Soho or the apartment stays in the high rise. But below that, below around level six or seven, the tower needs to become porous with public space that links up that tower with other towers and that links up the new generation of retail because it's not about a shopping mall box anymore. It's about a connective tissue of retail streets in the air. Shops are secondary function. Primary function is connecting people in public space. Now we can introduce some residential into that mixed commercial. And the residential in the same way, up the tower, has decks for social connection, for social interaction. Every 10 floors, every refuge terrace. We have connectivity of open space. And the last few floors of the residential tower are in, inextricably connected into that tissue, the porous tissue of the hotel, the office, the Soho, and the retail, mm -hmm. forming this wonderful amalgam of pedestrianized precinct on multiple levels. Now, I am convinced this is the development model of the future for China. This is the way we can bring our workers to the office buildings and bring their residential apartments closer to the office buildings to create a truly dynamic live-work environment. <laughs> 我现在的这个地方是在北京办公室最贵的地方，北京的金融街，整个北京市，呃，它的租金应该是是其他各个区的几倍，呃，但是我发现它有一个商机啊，我是觉得我看了，呃，最近应该看了十几个地方的办公室，我觉得好的非常非常少，这办公空间的设计其实是非常少，我自己会觉得就是。呃，办公的这种城市改造，啊，其实是机会很大的。我不知道您在这方面是怎么去考虑的。嗯哼，刚才也是提到有个，就是听众他提到了，就是北京的这个可持续的方面，其实我就觉得它是一致的。嗯 ，Yeah, urban renovation is uh, that's again. So, uh, we need to consider uh two aspects of urban renovation. First of all, in the West. Urban renovation is concerned with much smaller scale uh, interstitial work. 
in China, we're talking about taking entire districts and, uh, and, and putting new buildings in, in a sequential fashion that does not disturb the culture and the people of, of that district. So we're taking down buildings that possibly were built quickly, not to a very high standard or have overcome their initial use. And we're going to replace them with higher density uh, buildings. And, and of course, that's essential. If we're to preserve the agricultural land around our cities, our cities need to be compact. So we must revisit the city as it exists and use the land in the most efficient way possible. And now, with new technology, we can develop our cities, develop our buildings with much higher density than we had before. So it makes complete sense to carry out urban renewal. Urban renewal is more expensive. It takes time. And to do it in a humane way, you need to consider the residents or the, the people who are living on that land at the moment. But it's certainly one of the most important tools to developing our cities and particularly already well-developed cities like Beijing or Shanghai and Shenzhen, Guangzhou. Um, the other aspect of this urban regeneration, urban renewal is that we can bring to bear the most up-to-date methods of living. And I've been talking about live work and new aspirations, new expectations that people have for the way they live and the way they work. So as we carry out urban renewal, we can build this into our new designs and our new buildings. Um, I'm exhausted. <laughs> um, no, I, I think, I mean, it's fascinating. Um, a one-hour interview is, is, is a very long interview. Um, uh, so we get through an awful lot of, of uh, topic. We get through a lot of material, which is, which is great. Um, I think, as I said, that at this time in COVID, we, we all have a lot of thoughts in our heads a lot of things we've been thinking about and therefore sharing this information is very, very important. And I do think, you know, as a, as a sort of final message almost, that, that we need to overcome this incredible nationalism and inward looking that's going on around the world now and look beyond that to, to a better world that we can create. I mean, COVID is giving us a chance to create a better world, a more connected world, a more humane world, because we've all had to deal with the same difficulty. We've all having to overcome the same problem. So I do hope that we'll all see, we'll all find our way through this together uh, without dissension, discord that is occurring sometimes at, the time, at this point in time. But yes, thank you very much indeed. It was great to meet you all virtually. Virtual meetings are wonderful. Thank you very much. 好的最后我想总结了这次今天说的几个关键词因为我们前几期只是采访了这种个人明星式的事务所的代表者那这次呢是采访的是一千四百人团队的这样的一个创始人所以他今天提到几个词一个是谦逊服务野心分享融合关